Join me in welcoming the 2023 SCI Idolist, Dr. Pam Eddington. So this is the opportunity to hug like anybody and everybody. <laughs> I'm so thrilled to be here tonight and, and a little nervous because there's so many of you just looking at me and, and you're, I'm not on a stage and I can see you at eye level. Um, so I, I was asked to um, offer some remarks and I figured this is a good opportunity for me to talk a little bit about the community college movement. We are in such an amazing town of Boston where higher education is prized. Uh, internationally, people look at us and say, wow, look at what they're doing for colleges and universities. One day, my goal is for folks to say, wow, what are they doing for community colleges? And 50% of the undergraduates who go through our community colleges to blossom. In my mind, there is only one goal, is to lift every single one of my students to the middle class, period. Um, education is a tool for us to do that. And nationally, in the community college movement that began 100 years ago, there are 2,500 community colleges now. I would love to come up here and say, I'm just special. Bunker Hill is so special. But we're not special. We are, we are in some way a part of that 2,500 community colleges across the country. We're medium-sized, 16,000 students, and, um, and, and we're diverse. And, and frankly, um, all of our students come within 10 miles of the college on the Orange Line, which is anchored on one end with Bunker Hill, and on the other end with the wonderful Roxbury Community College, whose president, Jackie Jenkins Scott, is here today. <laughs> special we're special together um, because our students are not different they really are the same students um, a little bit about our students so I, I said that I have 16,000 students and um, the average age of our students is 26 I should have made you guess that that would have been funny um, only a third of our students come right out of high school so you know Charlestown High School Brighton High School the high schools around our area the other the other two-thirds are adults they are four out of five are working, many of them full time, many of them two jobs, many of them working for you, actually, in the city. And three out of five are parents. And half of those parents are single moms. So as, as I tell the story, I, I want you to really have a picture in your mind what kind of opportunity costs it will cost these students to actually come to me to better their lives to get into the middle class. And 77% of our students are living on the lowest two quintile of income. And I'll give you a comparison. Over at my, our, our neighbor, neighboring Harvard and MIT, um, who are wonderful partners of ours, their students, 77% of them, are living at the top two quintile of income. But here's the magic. When they graduate from my place or Jackie's place, they flip two quintile into the middle class. And I can tell you that if higher education was ever magical, it is in the invention of the community college 100 years ago that made us what we are today. So why is it okay for us to leave 50% of our students behind? It's not. So I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about that. And which is not to say that our students don't come with challenges, right? The challenges that we in some way have created when we deep funded a lot of our communities that needed that funding. Um, the social network in our communities of color and our communities of poverty suck. And I would not use any other word than that because we have not been investing in it. So healthcare, K-12, transportation, housing, childcare, you know all of this. When, when, when COVID came, right, how many of those things actually were intact in our communities? of Chelsea, of Everett, our gay cities in Malden, inner city Boston, right, where our immigrants come. I think there's probably about 50 to 60%, if not more, of immigrant and immigrant families in my, in my student population. 
and they are bilingual or emerging bilingual. They are going to be the asset of tomorrow's society. Yet when we think about community college, what do you think about, right? All of the mythologies that are out there. And those mythologies is what I fight every day. And when I look to my colleagues like Jackie, we say, yeah, that's our job, right? To eliminate poverty and generational poverty. So when, when I think about what it took to become this idealist that you seem to think I am. Um, you are. <laughs> I love you, Jackie. <laughs> you should see us in other venues. I mean, I think people walk around us. <laughs> Um, I am the daughter of, 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 well, I am immigrant and I, I'm the daughter of immigrant parents. I came from Hong Kong when I was 11 and my port of entry was Miami. And it was just now that I was talking to Roberto and he tells me that over 300,000 um, individuals actually came from Cuba in a very recent count. And, and they're coming in through, through the Southern border throughout the United States. But when I came, I was part of chain migration I was the 11 year old with two siblings and parents who were middle class in Hong Kong. When we stepped foot onto the United States, we knew we were blessed that we we're gonna have good education. But what my parents sacrificed was a middle class life for themselves. They put the children through college and all three of us were you know, typical immigrant children, right? Except I became a doctor, but not the kind that helps people. <laughs> is an engineer, but he's aerospace engineer, so he's not working, you know, on, on, on some project in, um, in, on, on the ground. And my sister, my sister's an artist. So, so somehow the immigrant dream got changed a little bit. Um, but it is because of their sacrifice that I'm standing here. So every time I look at a student at my college, I swore to myself that they will not go through what my parents went through. And Many of you are immigrants, you know what that means. They will not do what my dad did, which is to work as a waiter in a Chinese restaurant all his life. They will not do what my mom did, which was to take in garment work so she can be at home with the children when we came home. Um, they're immensely proud and they do have the immigrant spirit. But sometimes I think we romanticize what it means to have immigrant grit we romanticize what it means to pull yourself up by your bootstraps when you have no boots, right? We romanticize what it means to be in poverty and that meritocracy is all that means, um, that is all that needs. You can be very, very smart, like many of my students are. You can be very, very talented. That is evenly distributed across the nation and across populations, but opportunity is not. So I'm hoping that my idealism will help pull all of my students into the middle class. And I'm grateful that all of you are my partners because before I leave, all of you are gonna come and find out what kind of partnership you can have. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you uh, for honoring me tonight. And when I look at folks like Michael Curry um, and, um, and, and uh, Natasha, I am blessed to be in their company and they too will find that partnership before we leave tonight. So thank you very much, everyone.